Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Economic Impact of an Outbreak. Throughout this session, please type your questions into the Q&A box located in the top right or bottom section of your WebEx screen. We will attempt to answer all questions in the time allowed. Now, I would like to hand it over to BC's MS in Applied Economics Program Director and the moderator for tonight's panel, Dr. Alexander Tomek. Sasha? To say that these are unprecedented times would be an understatement, well, of at least a decade, if not a century. And we are dealing with the multidimensional issue. So to get to the economic impact, we will look at first at uh, what, you know, how do we model these infection data, because that seems to be driving all the decisions about the lockdowns. What are the impacts on the healthcare system? Because again, that's uh, what is also driving decisions because we don't want healthcare systems to be overwhelmed. We look at the economic impact and then at the broader impact. So in other words, we want to pull back the curtain on all things COVID. So to do that, uh, I'm joined by four of my colleagues, uh, faculty in the Applied Economics Program, and they are presented here in the order in which I will ask the initial questions of them. First is Larry Fulton. He's the Associate Professor and Undergraduate Programs Director in the Health Sciences at the University at the Texas State University. In our program, he teaches data analysis and predictive analytics and forecasting, and from time to time, a big data course. Uh, next will be Diana Bowser. She is the Associate Professor at Brandeis University, Heller School for Social Policy and Management, and she is um, Head of uh, Executive Programs at Harvard's T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Diana is currently teaching empirical health economics for us, and she is a health economist. Uh, after Diana, we'll talk to Ataman Ozildrim. Uh, Ataman is a senior director and economics and global research chair at the conference board, basically the person behind the leading economic indicator and the consumer confidence indexes that you hear all about. In our program, he teaches measuring business cycles, trends, and growth cycles. And finally, we have Professor John Erdel, who is professor of practice at the Boston College with tremendous experience in consulting around the world and a long, long history of interaction with students. Uh, in our program, he teaches applied macroeconomic theory, and he will talk to us about any outstanding issues at the very end. So with that, uh, I know everybody is eager to hear from our experts, so let's start with Larry. So Larry, um, we know there is a lot of uncertainty around the number of COVID cases. This is what seems to be driving all of the decisions that then have impact down the line on the healthcare system and the economy and, uh, and, and even beyond. Uh, so talk to us a little bit about all of these numbers. I mean, what methods are we using to come up with these projections? Uh, where is the curve headed? It seems like every day we hear of a new model and another model gets discredited. So just walk us briefly through all this. Where, where are we? Where are we headed in terms of the number of cases? Well, in terms of cases and case fatalities, I can give you right up front that they're going to be somewhere between zero and 328 million in the United States. So we, we have a forecast. We're good to go, right? <laughs> and that's what it seems like if you look at the forecasting models or sometimes. But actually, I, the forecasting models are based upon sound science. Uh, by way of background, I just want to say is I do teach predictive analytics and machine learning. And I, uh, I used to be the chief of operations research for the Army Medical Department. But that said, I am not a public health expert, although I did stay in a Holiday Inn Express last night. It opened and I decided to get out of the house for a minute. At any rate, what I want to cover today is four classes of models. And those four classes of models include uh, kind of a basic 1927-era differential equation set. Um, more advanced statistical uh, stochastic processes, uh, Markov models, uh, models that have incorporated machine learning, and some of the ensemble models employed by the CDC. And I think the CDC has done a good job, if you take a look at what they're doing, of taking models from various uh, respected institutions and their own and combining them. And that's the ensemble models I'll discuss. But before we get started with those models, I think we should ask ourselves truly, what are the challenges in the forecasting models? We've seen some that have projected that the entire world would die, and some that have you know, projected that nobody would die. All right? 
so the hard part is that this is a very, very new virus, and the data we have is, is suspect so, and limited. Uh, Dr. Rob Hinman, who is a forecasting guru from uh, the New Zealand, Australia region of the world, uh, puts it this way. We have limited and misleading data. And when you have that, that becomes a problem. We are just getting to the, the part where we have more and more data. But even so, with that data that we do have, we cannot properly estimate exactly what's going on. For example, John Hopkins reports that the case fatality rate, those people who have COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, um, divided by uh, who, who, those who die from it, divided by those who have it, is about 6%. Okay, that's certainly an upper bound, but the problem is that many may have had mild cases, never received testing, and have no idea that they had uh, SARS-CoV-2 of any form. Uh, some of you may fall into that group yourself. I know that my wife and I went on a cruise in January, and we came back, and the whole ship had an upper respiratory infection, never tested, not going to be in all likelihood. I'll get tested for the antigen, but that's about it. Another, another problem is, is the global reporting system. We get data from other countries. Now, we can report truthfully uh, by the states, but when we get data from other countries, that data may be poorly reported or incomplete or just inaccurate. So trying to use that for our own models is difficult at best. So that becomes a, another issue with forecasting. In, because COVID-19 is so new, we had very limited, limited experience with it. What percent of the population acquire immunity after exposure? We don't know. And many of the models that, basic models, which I'm just about to discuss, would suggest that almost everybody, if not everybody, acquire immunity. And so there is a transition state that's called recovered. And once you're recovered, you never become susceptible again. Well. That, do, that doesn't hold, at least in some cases, with COVID-19. At any rate, we do have tools, but I really wish we could go back to something simple like the 1850s cholera epidemic in London, where John Snow uh, mapped out all the cases, found the well, and pulled the well handle off. Wish we could do that, but unfortunately, we're going to be stuck uh, trying to figure out how this is going to go. So some of the basic epidemiological models that, that start our forecasting come from 1927, Kermack-McKendrick theory. And really, th these models were real basic differential equations. There were three states proposed by this theory. You, you have a susceptible population, you have a population that gets infected, and a population that gets recovered. And the susceptible population, some transition to the infected, some transition to the recovered or died, but at the end of the day, when you add all those together, the N, or the population amount, stays constant. And that's a good basic way for looking at a, um, a pandemic model. It set the stage. The problem is there's some assumptions in those models that are really difficult to understand. How strong is the contagion, okay? What is the probability that you come in contact with an individual who has it and you are infected? That type of information is really needed for this model, and it's hard to get. You have to back into it with data, and if the data are not there or inferior, then you're backing into it with incomplete sets. So really, it's all about the data. The way to get around that somewhat is sensitivity analysis, but Truthfully, it becomes a problem. Fortunately, we're gathering enough data in the United States that our models will be become better and better as we go along. Okay, so the model was called the SIR model, susceptible, infected, and recovered model. And from the susceptible, you had at time T any amount becoming infected based upon transmission rates and, and how strong or contagious that virus is. And then you had at any time T, infections moving to the recovered or dead pile. There's lengths of time between there and what probability people move out of that group. Um, it has to be 
established. So again, we have to get distributions. That's the basic epidemiological model. We've moved along oh, quite a bit from that over the years since 1927, one might hope. And we have a lot of decent stochastic process models that add complexity into the mix. One of them is from, from Dr. Allison Hall from Harvard, and he has posted an R Shiny application, which allows you to kind of play with some of the components of the model and see what different uh, rates of infection, different susceptibility rates, et cetera, would do to the curve, if you will. All right, some of the more powerful models include immigrants and emigrants. And those immigrants and emigrants can come in, into change your susceptible population. So when President Trump cut off travel from China, what he was doing was he's making the modeling easier. Uh, when he cut it off from Europe, he made it even easier so that we're not having the same immigrant problem that goes into the pro uh, to the susceptible population or to what's called the exposed. In the previous model, we had only had susceptible, infected, and recovered. Now we have susceptible and exposed. So if those individuals coming from overseas had been exposed and they're in an incubation period and they don't ha yet show symptoms, they could still bring the disease into the population. So it becomes a more complex model with immigrants and emigrants. And then from the exposed, you can go into the infectious stage, just like in the previous model. But here's where it becomes important to understand why flattening the curve and why modeling this is a little more complex. All levels of infection are not different. Okay? Dr. Hall's model suggests mild, moderate, and severe classifications. I would add a different one, no. No symptoms whatsoever that you're just a carrier. Okay, so you can have three or four states or more, if you'd like, of categorizations of those with the infection. And the none mild or moderate probably are not the problem. It's going to be the severe. When you get those severe cases, the point is, is you can outstrip the ability of facilities like the New York hospitals to provide the treatment to the patients. Patients need ventilators when they're struggling to breathe and coughing up pink stuff, okay? You got to put them on ventilators. You have a finite set of ventilators. You have a finite set of nurses and doctors. So that is the group that really gets the focus. If we can slow the contagion down through social distancing if, or other measures, if we can just slow it down, that allows us to get the resources into play so that there is not a mass casualty situation, which a mass casualty situation is any time that, that a hospital is overwhelmed in terms of requirements. Also, there's some level where, where you might actually consider from a policy piece how you almost nationalize or federalize or whatever you want to call it, some of the medical assets when certain regions have problems. But that's for policy discussion, not for me. All right. On top of, oh, go ahead. With all these models, uh, where do you think we are on the curve? Are we nearing the peak? Are we uh, flattening it successfully? Well, I actually like the CDC forecast, and it looks to me like it is flattening pretty well. So their latest forecast um, looks to me like it's going to flatten sometime in just after the beginning of June, totally be uh, right near the top, and then it'll start coming down. That's what the CDC's ensemble forecast uh, looks like, and I kind of buy into that. I, I think they're doing a pretty good job pulling the best brains into the business and who are building those models and then putting together as a linear combination, and I'll talk about that in just two seconds. I'm almost done. I, I don't want to wax us with Tarek. I've already taken five minutes of the 10. So after the, uh, you got the infection piece, you've got the dead piece. Are we, but the part that we don't know is, what if you've had the infection? How, what proportion of those transition from having the infection back to the susceptible? Because often the models just ignore that. Because once you've had the flu, you're not likely to have it again in the season. Flu dies out, boom, boom, boom. But if you can return to susceptible and you don't really have immunity, then this is the concern, obviously, of you now have another group of susceptible people and your immunity of the herd drops as people lose uh, any sort of immunity from the disease itself. 
or if they never acquired it to begin with. All right, and lastly, a lot of the models consider uh, what social distancing contributes at some level. Some do not. They assume no intervention. Some assume social distancing, and, and some have kind of a, a, a moderate uh, effectiveness of social distancing model. And all those models, we'll talk about this, are used by the CDC. So the CDC, is, I mean, you look at their stuff. It, they're not trying to be biased at all. They're just trying to make forecasts on the best brains with data that are unfortunately flawed, but it is what we have. Class three of the models is one of the ones I'm most interested in, is some of the machine learning models. These models above have been used coupled with neural networks. So a neural network is kind of an automatic learning approach, and we don't have time to discuss it now, but bottom line up front, it uses layers and activation functions, and it tries to adjust path weights along a network to improve performance on what we know, and so that we can get, generate better forecasting models. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, Babakar, uh, Mabaya, uh, and Dia, I hope I didn't butcher the name at all, I have worked on one that, that literally couples the SIR model with uh, neural networks. And, but unfortunately, even the best tuned you know, machine learning algorithm can't work well if the data are not representative of the population. And that's our biggest issue is uh, why testing's so important, but testing's important even if you aren't sick. We need to find out who had the antigen and were sick, uh, truthfully, to get the exact, well, you'll never get the exact, but to get a good estimate or a better estimate at least. The final category of models are the ensemble models, and CDC uses about 12 of them. Uh, it uses about 12 models from different places, uh, and from, for example, they use some from uh, UCLA, one from UCLA, a couple from the, from the Imperial College with different assumptions, and a couple from here, a couple from there. And what they do is they take a linear combination of those models to produce a single forecast with error bands. And ensembling those models produces a better forecast overall. The last thing I'm going to talk about, because I'm really just about out of time, is things for you to think about. Forecasting models suffer from denominator problems and numerator problems. So we have lack of certainty. That's number one. Number two, many forecasting models are likely to underestimate the true susceptible due to those who have recovered asymp asymptomatically. Number three, Forecasting models are being applied to the entirety of the population. In fact, the case fatality rate, which is overestimated due to lack of information, um, is probably much different than that that's being reported. In New York City, uh, you can take a look, but only a fraction of their deaths, a small fraction of their deaths, were associated with individuals who did not have known underlying conditions. So there are different risk factors for different population groups. So think about that. Other than that, just recall that I did not get a master's or doctorate in public health, and I do not have any vested interest in any model, um, but that I, I think that the CDC is doing a reasonable job at trying to get the forecast right. And given the forecast, I'm looking at their curves, and it looks like by the middle of June, we'll definitely be at the flat spot. So a month from now, we'll definitely be at the flat spot. If I were to make a prediction, of course, all predictions are wrong. So that's all I have, sir. Thank you, Larry. And I will do a shameless plug for the program that some of these models you do cover in the, in the classes that you teach for us. So Diana, we heard uh, uncertainty, number one. We heard uh, the issue with uh, what is the true rate of illness and death. But one thing that's a constant, if you will, is the biggest problem is when the healthcare systems get overwhelmed. So all of these cases have had profound effect on healthcare systems around the world. We see different types of responses, different levels of, of, uh, of being overwhelmed and such. So what are some of the examples of these effects? And then what do you think will be the effect of COVID on the healthcare system in U.S.? Uh, not just during the epidemic, but also beyond. And then are there any features that, that you see that are maybe working better than others when you look at the different systems around the world? So with that, I turn it over to you. Great. Um, thanks so much. And uh, Larry, that was a great overview of all the different models. I'm not quite as optimistic 
as you are with June, but I guess we can debate that uh, offline. <laughs> Um, this is a really great question, Sasha, and uh, thank you so much. I'm uh, delighted to be here on the panel. And I do have to say that um, as a health economist, this is what I do for a living, uh, not study COVID, but I essentially look at different um, health policy changes that are happening in countries around the world. And I use that natural variation in these policies to understand the impact on health systems and then eventually to measure how that impacts mortality and other health outcomes in specific populations. So um, the last, and I, this usually takes me years and years to measure the impact. So the last three months has just been fascinating for me because what we've been seeing really is natural variation in all countries around the world with regard to how they are dealing with the COVID outbreak, not only in terms of the public health policies that they're putting in place, and the social distancing policies, but again, how their health systems are handling the, this new outbreak, this new disease that we really know, know, we're learning about what, as of January, we didn't really know that much about. So, so for me, it's just a fascinating question. And, um, and I think that Larry's correct, that the data is really important, but I think one of the problems with the models is that it's changing continuously and some of the key inputs that, that regulate the models have to do with how we're containing the spread of COVID, which really has to do with policies, and it has to do with how individuals are following those policies, so behavior change, which is really hard. So looking at countries around the world, like I said, all countries are dealing with this COVID outbreak differently. And so what I want to do is just take a handful of countries, and, and what you could do really is Modeling is hard because you have to pick it into the future, but looking at policies retrospectively and seeing which ones had the biggest impact on containing the spread is actually a lot easier and probably a little more fun. Um, so what you could do really is sort of look at the policies that countries have put in place with regard to public health and social distancing and see which ones um, are having some of the largest impacts. And I think already we can make some of those associations. Some countries that really came out early and put in strong public health and social distancing measures seems to be the ones that are containing the spread and then have less impact on their health systems at which we would measure in terms of the number of deaths per population size. So for example, Germany is one place that's been in the news. Angela Merkel is a scientist. She took this pandemic very seriously from the start she not only did lots of testing, but she put in contact tracing very early um, in terms of containing the spread and lots of rules and regulations, um, which have been followed quite closely in Germany. And the mortality rate there is quite low, nine per 100,000 about um, throughout the course of the pandemic. New Zealand is another place that um, also the prime minister there took this very seriously. Not only did testing quite early, um, but they also have put in public policies that are easy to understand. Models are hard to understand, but they put in a policy, it's a color-coded policy that at the local level in New Zealand, you know where you live, you're either red or blue or green or whatever colors, and based on those colors, you know if your location is doing a good job containing the spread and whether it's safe to move around or not. So those policies are easy to understand. The Czech Republic also took this very seriously, and they took a different route. They very early on said everyone has to wear masks. March 21st, masks were mandated in the Czech Republic, and if you went outside your home, you had to wear them with serious repercussions. Masks were not put in place here in Massachusetts until April 6th. So, um, so we're, we're behind in terms of these policies that um, have been happening. And then um, I don't want to get into politics in the United States, but we know that there's lots of policies and different um, uh, ideas around public health and social distancing, but every state in the U.S. has done it um, quite differently, which makes modelers crazy. And Larry will attest to that. You have to keep going back and tweaking your model every time a different state decides to open up or close or wear masks or don't wear masks. So it's a really uh, uh, interesting question, and I think that you can look across these countries retrospectively and say, well, which of these policies work? It's really a cost-benefit analysis that you could look back retrospectively and look. And just of the, what, the countries that I've mentioned, um, Germany, nine per 100,000 in terms of mortality, 
New Zealand is, has only had 20 deaths throughout the entire time. Czech Republic has a low mortality rate. The U.S. mortality rate, I think, is upwards of 26 or 20, 24 right now per 100,000. And the U.K., I didn't mention that country, um, but now they have some policies in place. But early on, they were toying with the idea of just letting the virus run its course and trying to see if they could reach herd immunity, which then, of course, would put a lot of pressure on that healthcare system in a very short period of time and, and would have been catastrophic. Um, now they have a high death rate. They're catching up now, but their death rate is higher than the United States. So, so you can see um, globally that there's been a lot of variation, and all of these public health policies and social distancing policies have a direct impact on systems. So I'll just take the last few minutes to mention um, the United States. And I don't think I need to go into a lot of detail on um, what's happening with health systems here in the U.S., because it's on the news. You see it. Um, these system impacts in the U.S. that we see and are predicted in the models, I call them short-term impacts because they are they're taxing our health system today. Um, that's the nurses and the doctors that we need on the front lines, the ICUs that we need and the models count how many we need, the ventilators, the drugs, uh, the tests. Those are things that we need now, and and and. Our systems are doing well. Massachusetts and New York, I would say, are some of the places with the biggest outbreaks. And I know in Massachusetts hospitals, there there's room that we have more um, ICU beds that are available if the um, if it escalates farther. I think what I'd like to do though is end on the long-term impacts, looking into the future for the healthcare system. And I'd like to end on a positive note because I do feel like um, there may be some good things that come out of this epidemic. Um, I've worked with the U.S. healthcare system for a number of years, and it's a very complicated system, and we all know that there's a lot of criticisms of our healthcare system. And we've been trying to make changes in how care is delivered in our system for years, trying to create ways to create efficiencies and improve access to care. One of the ways that we've tried to do this for a number of years is to increase telemedicine and virtual visits. We've been working on this for years. It's very hard to get physicians, to get providers and patients to change behaviors and embrace um, virtual visits. So with like a light switch with COVID, hospitals are closed, facilities are closed, and overnight we had to move to virtual visits. And part of it's an economic reason, revenues were down and providers needed to get those patients into their facilities. And the other reason is that people needed to be seen. So overnight, we had this switch and virtual visits are now being used, they're being paid for. And anecdotally, I've talked to providers and patients that say that they like the virtual visits. I'm sure many of you on this call have needed to see your provider in the last three months and maybe you had a virtual visit. So there's probably a segment of the population where virtual visits could continue, could be paid for, they're more efficient and you can, access services easier for many people with virtual visits. Now, this isn't for everyone, so I'm not saying this should continue for everyone, but there are some positive things that are happening in our U.S. healthcare system. I think we need to look really closely at those and see what are some of these efficiencies that have been gained through this horrible pandemic that we can continue on with that may provide a better healthcare system in the end. So I'll stop there. I'll take um, questions um, if you'd like. There's other things that I can talk about with the U.S. healthcare system um, because I think there's other changes that have happened that are really important. Um, but I'll stop there and I'm delighted to take any further questions. And thank you, Diana. Uh, there are actually questions coming in specifically for you, but we will do that uh, at the end if, if that is okay. So Ataman, on to you. Uh, Conference Board has been publishing a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, research on the uh, economic impacts of this all. So we are now looking at, uh, is it a V-shaped uh, recovery? Is it a U-shaped recovery? Where is the bottom? Is it all maybe I-shaped or L-shaped? New York Times published a front page in order to illustrate the job losses. They actually had the graph across the top and then it went all the way to the bottom of the page because we are moving scales to accommodate this economic <laughs> data. So lead us through these economic impacts. I mean, what do we expect in the short term, medium term? Do you see any silver lining like Diana did? Um, talk to us about that a little bit, both in U.S. and globally. Yeah. 
Sure. Uh, well, uh, first of all, uh, Sasha, thank you for uh, inviting me to be uh, on this panel. It's an honor to be here uh, with the panelists. And it was great to hear from Diana and Larry because first and foremost, the issue that we're faced with is a public health crisis. It's a pandemic. It's a global pandemic. And, um, you know, uh, Larry was talking about the lack of information and the data flaws for estimating the the models about the epidemic, let alone estimating the impact of uh, the economic uh, impacts. So uh, we are faced with really unprecedented times. There is nothing uh, in our memory or even in history to compare it to. And uh, that makes uh, understanding what we're going through in terms of the economic impacts very, very difficult. And uh, the uncertainties don't come from the usual economic uncertainties we're used to. They're really coming from this whole big uh, public health issue. Uh, you know, will the public health um, sector uh, be able to handle the pandemic, the cases? Uh, how will those curves uh, evolve over time? When is the peak going to be reached? So those are the biggest uh, uncertainties uh, in the environment. And uh, th that really makes it very difficult to understand. And as a result, you know, we end up with the, this alphabet soup of uh, the diff different types of recessions, different types of recoveries. Is, is it going to be V-shaped, which we already know that there's a very sharp contraction. That's one side of the V. And then how is it going to recover on the other side? Um, and the reason that we see this big contraction is uh, because of the, the rational response to a pandemic is to essentially keep people apart, to, to stop transmission. And that's a major, major supply shock uh, to productive economy in the world. You have to tell factories to shut down. You have to tell workers to stay home. Now, that is followed immediately by a major demand shock because the demand side is basically um, uh, people having to stay home and curtailing their uh, spending. So it's followed by a big drop in consumer spending. And this is really what we saw happening in China, in Wuhan, and uh, all the other countries around the world are, are essentially, you know, uh, uh, showing the same, same playbook. Um, but then, you know, depending when the peak hits and how long the stringent containment measures are kept in place are the major uncertainties about how the recovery is going to unfold. So that V-shaped uh, contraction that we're talking about could turn into um, a, a U-shaped recovery if the containment measures are kept in place for a long time. That spreads out the, uh, the, the economic pain, but it also allows the health system to be able to, to manage the caseload so that the hospitals and the uh, doctors, nurses are not so overwhelmed so that we can treat everybody and save more lives. Um, now, uh, in terms of the epidemiologic uh, models, we're also uh, seeing that there could be these secondary waves or secondary peaks. That's what happened with the Spanish flu. Um, and if a second peak occurs uh, you know, later in the, uh, in the fall, and uh, as it might uh, uh, be likely to because of the nature of this virus, it's similar to a flu virus, which comes back in the fall, um, then we might end up with uh, another downturn because those stringent containment measures that were being uh, lifted are suddenly brought back on. Um, but hopefully we've learned from our initial experience early in the year, so maybe they won't be uh, as uh, drastic or uh, as um, as long lasting uh, because people have changed their behaviors. Uh, so that might lead us to a W type of uh, scenario. Um, so, you know, the, the alphabet soup keeps growing uh, because of the uncertainty around all of these things. And I think that ultimately uh, the, the uncertainties that determine which scenario plays out is really dependent on those uh, the, the peaks, is it May, is it June, and how long that containment measure uh, is going to be kept in place. I think that the complicating factor is that it is a global epidemic. 
So containing it in one country or one region is not really enough to address the whole issue because you could end up, um, you know, here in New York, we're finding out that the, the, the curve is kind of coming back down and we're thinking about reopening, but then are we going to end up uh, re-importing uh, the virus back from some other region that didn't quite go through the same experience and still has an outbreak. So there are lots of complicating issues uh, that uh, that makes it forecasting even more difficult than what Larry was talking about. Um, in that environment, I, in order to be, I think, more um, uh, resilient to the facts as they come in, uh, and to be more agile in decision-making, it's better to look at all those different scenarios uh, separately to kind of plot the course. It helps to uh, keep, a, keep a more open mind about it. And uh, I really like that uh, Larry mentioned the ensemble models because that type of looking at many models and looking at you know, whether you're having consensus or whether you can average them together uh, is going to be really more reliable than relying on a single model, regardless of how good it is, uh, I think especially in this environment, you don't want to put all your e eggs in one basket and to really keep an open mind about it. Um, but regardless of whichever models you look at, and we've crunched through a lot of different uh, models at the conference board, um, I think uh, the end of 2020 ends up being lower than uh, the beginning of 2020. So we're going to end up uh, finishing the year with a smaller economy, and uh, it's going to take much longer to dig out of the hole, hole that, uh, that we're finding ourselves in, whether it's V-shaped or W-shaped. Um, so maybe I will also end on a, a positive note. Um, we're seeing that many businesses around the world have uh, responded by um, taking sort of very drastic measures uh, the crisis management mode was in you know, early um, April, March, depending on what region you're in, what sector you're in. Um, but people have started to think about the future. And part of that thinking involves, well, you know, how is consumer psychology going to change? How are the, you know, what are those behavioral changes going to be? What will the future look like? And I think part of that uh, is the realization that there's going to be a lot more social distancing. Uh, restaurants will have to rearrange their dining rooms, even their business models, uh, let people in, you know, in smaller groups at a time, more spacing and so on. But we can use some of the, you know, digital technologies that are available to us, whether it's mobile apps, scheduling apps, uh, things like that will give us a, a new way to kind of reimagine what business life is going to be, what commercial life is going to be. And I think out of that, we're going to uh, end up seeing much more innovation. So in the longer run, uh, with you know, all, all these positive impacts, uh, we might end up with uh, a, a more positive uh, trajectory for economies around the world. So let me stop there. I'm sure uh, there'll be more uh, questions uh, that we can get to, uh, especially with uh, the other economic impacts and the global impact. So thank you, Ataman. And just to put things in the context, we saw 4.8% drop in the first quarter of G, you know, GDP drop. And then what's lost in that number, I think, is the fact that we were open for most of the first quarter, that basically it was roughly about two weeks of the first quarter that we went into this lockdown, so to speak. So. As we all eagerly await the second quarter numbers, I'm not going to put you on the spot quite yet to give me the, the number, but let me then uh, move to Jan. Jan, with everything that everybody has said so far, uh, we are basically looking at what, what are some longer term impacts? What are some changes in habits? Uh, is there, are we returning to normal or will there be some new normal that will be unlike anything else we know, what are some policies, some attitudes that are changing for better or for worse? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Uh, I also want to thank you for including me uh, in this panel. And um, I want to make sure that, uh, um, that I emphasize that I have probably the most fun part uh, in this panel in terms of uh, talking about 
something that is going to be in the future that we don't have any data about yet. Um, but let me uh, take you to some of the notes that I uh, took and a couple of different things. Um, one, um, Larry mentioned that it's difficult to do the forecasting uh, because of data issues. I'm going to uh, throw another wrench and make it even more difficult. Um, it is even more difficult because the economic agents are changing behavior as we speak. So um, some of the audience uh, includes uh, my current students, actually my no longer students as of today, I gave their grades and I taught the um, principles course this semester, a, a big one. Uh, so I wanna take us to the fundamentals, uh, economic fundamentals to start with. And if you look at uh, the economic agents uh, and if you look at the demand side, and if you go to the very basics, what is behind the demand, it is the willingness and ability to pay. And both of them are taking a hit. Let's uh, look at the ability to pay. This is the income. This is the unemployment. This is what, uh, what was uh, mentioned uh, by, the, by the speaker be before me. Someone just talked about you know, how big the economy got a hit. That means people have less paychecks, therefore, therefore less income, hence the ability to pay gets a hit. But Something that people mention less is also the willingness to pay. So the agents are changing behavior in terms of also um, psych psychology. So even when we have a vaccine and even when there, is, uh, there are some uh, medicines that are effective, there will be what we call some residual fear. And some of the economic agents will have resistance to, uh, to go and consume. Uh, for instance, I don't think we're going to go to a movie theater in the near future, even if they are open. Um, but uh, there is also pent up demand. Uh, so if you think about um, uh, some people who are really ready to go out and, and spend and, and uh, um, go back to the normal, uh, you are going to see two opposing forces. But what you're going to see is definitely a shift, a change in the behavior of the economic agents. This is the demand side. But if you look at the supply side, it is even more interesting. In the supply side, there are many things happening. Some of the notes that I have. First, the supply chains are restructuring as we talk now. Uh, there is localization of production that's going on. Uh, we had a lot of um, buzzwords. Uh, we had the buzzword of flattening the curve, social, social distancing. Guess what the next buzzword will be? Uh, Ottoman just mentioned that a little bit with the restaurants. The next buzzword is de-densifying. So we're going to have to figure out how to de-densify many different units of uh, production. People are talking about factories operating in shifts at night when they are usually closed, operating in shifts where uh, the work workload is going to be divided in three, uh, the day shift, night shift, and the shift from home. We, we also see that... Um, there is increased automation. So three days ago, an interesting article came out from MIT, uh, from Darana Jemolu, talking about AI and the increase of automation. I think the uh, health epidemic now has accelerated investment into automation. His numbers tell us that, that on the average, one robot replaces about 3.3 workers. And in some industries, the number goes up, uh, up to 6.6. .6. That is a complete change in the supply behavior that, that is going to be contributing to many different shifts in the economy. Uh, Daron makes a point that this will make the income inequality even deeper uh, in many countries. And, um, and the last one was the work from home. As someone also mentioned that you probably heard that uh, Twitter just announced that all the workers now, you can stay at home indefinitely. So you can work from home uh, from now on. Uh, and that is not necessarily a good thing. If you look at another recent article, you find that on the average, people who work from home uh, are working three days, uh, three hours longer per day. Uh, if, if you have been uh, working from home, you probably experienced it too. This has been one of my busiest periods since we closed, uh, teaching the um, 300 student course online, an introduction course online, uh, was uh, for me much more time consuming than what I do in, in the class. Um, so if you put all of these together, I agree with uh, Ataman, yes, there are some innovations and there will be some positive change, but there are also many, many drawbacks that are happening that, that are affecting the economy now. So a couple of other um, points. 
So we have been locked in our houses for uh, more than two months. And guess how long it takes to build a, a habit? It takes two months to build a habit. So what's happening now is the consumers are also building new habits. So they had the time to reflect. They had the time to think. I am hearing from my colleagues, from my friends, that they are being now ashamed that they have so many clothes, that they had, they, they had so many things that they think they are starting to question, do we really need this? Is this really necessary? Um, so these are going to really uh, change the behavior of the economic agents. Another big uh, question that we have is, do we really need to travel that much? If you look at the data in the US right now, the, um, the airline passenger traffic is at 5% of what it was during the normal times. Couple of other things uh, in my notes. These are, a lot of them are questions. I will not provide too many answers, but I think these are interesting questions. Um, another uh, question that people have been asking is, is this a crisis of the capitalistic system based on perpetual growth and consumption? So do we have to reconsider how uh, we divide the pie? Uh, and this, this is important. This brings us to the income inequality part. So uh, people started to ask, is there room for industrial policy? Is there room for a government policy that will pick and choose some of the winners uh, in these crazy times? Are there limitations of the markets? People have been writing about how the stock market, the markets have been divorced of the reality of, uh, of the economy that Ataman was talking about. Uh, the consum US consumers have never been this bullish. So it is a really interesting divide um, that we should take, uh, take note of. Couple of, uh, uh, another important thing is what's going to happen to the globalization and how integrated we were. And again, uh, last week, Danny Rodrik from Harvard had a piece on that and he said, well, the retreat from what he calls hyper-globalization can lead to two different things. It, he says maybe it will escalate the trade wars and it will cause a rising ethno-nationalism. Uh, or he says maybe we will end up with a more sensible, more uh, inclusive model of economic uh, globalization. And, uh, and this is really an interesting time. It also showed us the vulnerabilities in the economic and financial system that we have. And maybe at this juncture, um, we need to make a decision. Uh, and the, deci the decision that the policymakers make will probably shape how the new economy is going to look. I'm going to uh, maybe wrap it up with um, also talking just a little bit about um, developing countries, not only the US, uh, the uh, outside of the United States, what's happening. Uh, I've been here in Boston for 27 years, but I'm still keeping my accent. I'm originally from uh, Turkey. And uh, what's happening in Turkey has been different, completely different than uh, here. Uh, my parents, who are about 65 years old, have been basically in house arrest in Turkey more than two months. Uh, and uh, if, if you were also younger than 20 years, you were also not allowed to leave your home. You, were, you, you would be uh, facing a really high uh, fine. And the logic behind this was that we need the people who are in the workforce to go work. The students, the schools are closed anyway. Um, we don't want the students uh, running around and spreading the virus, so let's lock them in the house. And the vulnerable people over 65, they should also not leave the house. And that had a couple of consequences. One of the consequences is that the, the toll of the epidemic was much higher uh, for the lower income working class. Okay, so they, they actually, they were continuing to go to work and they were hit hard. The second thing is uh, an interesting juxtaposition of that to, to the US economy. If you think about the, uh, the, the consumption and, and, and the, one of the agents uh, who, uh, uh, who operate in the economy, the demand side, in the United States, um, more than 40% uh, of the spending is done by people 55 years or older. So if you keep them in the house, you may think that you are keeping the, uh, the supply side going, but the demand side still gets a big, big hit. I will stop here. I have more notes. I have more interesting uh, um, 
questions uh, rather than answers, but I will stop here and uh, leave some time for questions. Thank you. Thank you, John, and thank you, everybody else. So we do have uh, quite a few questions. Uh, so I will try to lump some of them together because they ask about uh, uh, some common themes. And the first one, and, and Diana, it's uh, actually directed uh, to you, uh, is uh, we, you know, considering that African American and Latinos are more impacted in the United States than other groups, do we see this around the world? And I'll join to that another question that also talks about the impact on the blue collar workers versus white collar workers. Is this uh, something that's US specific or is this something that we are seeing uh, around the world? Yeah, um, thanks so much. I, I think that's a good good question. Um, and yes, in the United States, we're seeing uh, differential effects for different parts of the United States um, and also different populations in the United States. And I think that we're seeing that around the globe as well. And it, it goes back to what I said in, in my first um, part of the um, talk, is that the social distancing measures um, and some of these public health policies are hard to implement in places um, where there's individuals that are living in crowded spaces, um, lots of people living in the same home. It gets in the employment a little bit because those are people that have to go out and work. They can't afford to stay home. They don't have jobs like us where they can video online into work. We're very fortunate to be able to do that. So in those situations, you're going to have more vulnerable groups. Um, I have some funding from the World Bank, actually, and we're, we're looking at some of these um, vulnerable groups and migrant populations in countries to see the um, impact of COVID on these vulnerable populations in comparison to um, other populations. So I think it's a, a valid point, um, and it's, it needs to be looked at. Again, it's data. It's hard to get data at the country level. Um, it's even harder to get data within specific populations in, within a country. So. Um, in the studies that we're doing, we're actually trying to collect data on our own to get this information. But yeah, it's hard hard to get that data. Thank you. Uh, and Ataman, uh, white collar versus blue collar workers, is it a skills story or is it industry story? Because it sure seems uh, there is a lot of demand for certain jobs in some industries. And what, what are we looking at? Is this, uh, what, what is the story of the impact on our workers? Well, uh, clearly, uh, there there is a divergence uh, in terms of the type that's uh, the type of work that's being done, and in some cases, it is possible, uh, especially in the white collar professions, to be able to switch to you know working from home, and that was a very big um, switch for a lot of companies, a, a, a large portion of the the workforce. Uh, unfortunately, it's not uh, always available to. Um, you know, what uh, we're calling essential workers now or blue collar workers. Um, and it, it, it's possible in some uh, situations uh, to design uh, workforce policies, which would an allow that type of work to, to go on, uh, to be able to, um, you know, uh, uh, I mean, a very simple example might be, if you're gonna get an appliance repair person in your apartment, uh, you know, uh, is there a way to kind of do some pre-screening or arrange for the different times? I don't know, I'm uh, kind of uh, speculating here, but we can find creative ima imaginative ways to bring some of those, uh, the, some of the blue collar work uh, back into the, the workplace as well, but others might be more difficult and requires a, a very, very different type of uh, work environment. Thank you. So another question, uh, and I will uh, couch it in a uh, little bit in my own predictions from 2008-2009, uh, I thought we will surely see inflation uh, given how much money was pumped into the economy back then. Well, what we are seeing now looks like the stimulus from both monetary and fiscal side will dwarf what was done in 2008-2009, and it will be worldwide. So we are seeing a decrease in prices already in some goods. I mean, oil was famously below zero for a while. We are seeing spikes in other uh, uh, goods. Groceries obviously are getting much more expensive uh, due, at this point due to the demand and supply issues more so than the monetary and fiscal policy. 
A uh, big question in, in uh, Ataman, Jan, or uh, Diana, and Larry, if you want to chime in. Uh, how are we going to be able to avoid inflation this time? Well, that, that's a great uh, question, and I can try to take a stab at it. Um, I, uh, just to get us started, I, it's very hard to predict. Um, it's just a combination of the supply and demand shocks. Uh, but I think what we will see is a lot more volatility in prices. Uh, as you mentioned, um, you know, in, in some cases, even though there is no demand, we're, we're seeing uh, price spikes. So the, a lot more variability across sectors and industries. Uh, uh, and uh, of course, you know, what was happening in oil prices was probably a, a, you know, a combination of things with the geopolitics going on between Russia and Saudi Arabia. Uh, compounded by the fact that there's this pullback in demand. Um, but um, so that doesn't necessarily lead us immediately to an inflationary environment. I think in the immediate short term, we're looking at much more disinflation or deflation uh, because of uh, what's happening uh, to the economy. Uh, inflation, if it does show up, is going to be a much more longer term prospect, I think. Um, any opinions? Um, I, I completely agree with Atom, and I actually hope that we will see some inflation because I think at that time uh, we will be uh, dealing with something that we know much better. Uh, I, at this point, I'm not worried about inflation. We have um, much more immediate, uh, many more immediate problems that we have to solve. Um, and I also think that if the money that's pumped into the economy, uh, transforms into tangible goods and services that are then absorbed by the economic agents, it will not necessarily create a high level of inflation. So it also depends on how well the economy will be functioning once we gradually uh, return to the new normal. Uh, the keywords here are gradual. And, uh, and then another keyword is, another question is, once we find the new normal, or what the economists call the steady state, what is the damage going to be? Uh, the uh, recent article from last week in The Economist was talking about the 90% economy, that it, it was predicting that 10% uh, of the output will be uh, unviable uh, and will end up with the 90% economy. And it, it sounds good that 90% is a big number, but the article was, I think, uh, laying out uh, many problems that it can bring uh, along with it. So again, uh, inflation is for me not one of the top priorities when it comes to the problems that we need to solve now. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, so next question, uh, and I will again start with the with the preface. So we do not shy away from hard questions uh, at Boston College nor in in this program. And I don't think I will let you uh, slide on it either. Uh, but the question is basically, how do we balance the economic damage with saving lives? Uh, in other words, you know, there will be deaths from COVID, uh, there will be deaths from unemployment and mental issues and such. But what I will like, so that's the basic question, but let me thank the person who rephrased it uh, in a much nicer way, which is, how can we process to, in the same time, to save lives and improve the economic situation? So I'm going to call on you in the order I see you on the screen, uh, and then and then uh, see what you what you have to say. So, John. Thank you. So I mean, the the trick that everybody is trying to do is not to have the trade-off or to minimize the trade-off. So that's why we have been staying at home for a, for a long time. Uh, that's why everybody has been talking about flattening the curve. Um, so will there be some trade-off? Yes. And if, uh, if you twist my arm and if you say, okay, you have to tell me uh, who's, who's gonna be sacrificed, how much, I will tell you that this will probably differ from uh, local, uh, governance to local governance, and it will differ from uh, the precautions that we are going to take. It will also differ from the level of uh, economic 
uh, comfort that that or economic um, uh, buffer that people have at different locations. Um, there there is different levels of economic buffer that they um, that they can still stay at home, uh, stay viable, but. Uh, to give you the importance of the urgency, I can tell you two things. Even in the United States, um, now the the conversation started to shift from a liquidity problem into solvency problem, uh, which is much more difficult to, to, to handle. And in developing countries, it became actually survival. Uh, people staying at home um, uh, are actually not bringing any food into the family. So um, here in the United States, we are relatively much luckier. My answer to that, it will depend on the location. It will depend on also local governance and, uh, and what they are imposing. Thank you, Jan Ataman. Um, well, I, I tend to agree that, uh, you know, there is no one size fits all uh, solution to something like this. It's a very complicated public policy issue, um, and uh, you probably need to approach it uh, on a more sort of local or regional um, level, but with a lot of uh, coordination. And um, you you need the coordination because it is a um, it's a public good that we're dealing with, um, public health, and uh, it has a lot of externality. And um, I, it, it's really encouraging to see, you know, people coming together and understanding that there is a short-term cost, and uh, that helps us to kind of get through the crisis and manage through it. Um, but I think in order to make the, the right public policy choices, we need uh, a lot of good information, good data. Um, we need to keep working on those models. And uh, we need also uh, transparency and uh, a sort of good uh, governance infrastructure. Thank you, Ataman. Diana? Um, so I would say that um, there are trade-offs, but I think if it's done right, the trade-off is minimized because um, if you put the public policies in place early um, and you have strict rules, then you can come back sooner. And we're seeing some of these countries that did that. They took it very seriously, maybe even Turkey. Um, and so they're going to be able to open up and start some some pieces of the economy. And I think that's another thing that you need the data. Um, we need to know which which industries are the safest to open first. Um, and so there need to be strict policies in place with regard to where should we be opening regionally, locally versus nationally, and then which industries are the safe. Because yes, um, saving lives are is the most important for me. Um, and then we have to balance that with making sure that the economy comes back as well. Yeah, I agree that saving lives is important, but unemployment kills people. So the suicide rate is going to go up. Everything else is going to go up. So we have to take, let me give you an example from, I live in San Antonio, Texas. San Antonio, Texas, we've had 55 deaths from COVID-19 since its inception. 55. We get more more car accident deaths in this region in a couple months than that. So we've shut down an entire economy. I get it because we're trying to contain. But there are logical and reasonable steps to put those at risk in better position while still letting the economy burn a little bit without shutting everything down. And I think my biggest thing is being from Texas, I'm pretty independent and we, you know, if if you're going to do stuff to the entire economy that's going to have effects, it's going to cost lives on one end, and on the other end, it's going to cost, I uh, would judge Napolitano and some others would call civil liberties. So at what point are we actually infringing on the rights of others to carry out their lives? We got people here. Our food lines are wrapped around the block for people trying to get food because a lot of people live paycheck to paycheck. Some families, uh, the food banks are having problems keeping up. The farmers have started delivering food because they can't sell it. They just started delivering for free, so stop rotting in their fields. Uh, what we've done 
has maybe gone too far when we know that there's a select group in the population that are higher at risk, the elderly, those with underlying conditions, and, and now there are some use, very few, but some use that, that you have to be uh, cautious with, particularly after they've had COVID-19, they can get an inflammatory response. But providing common sense measures, like, I mean, Massachusetts, I didn't know that you guys didn't want covering your mouths until recently. I mean, we've been doing that for a while. Uh, so that's kind of weird. So, I mean, for a person in Texas, we've been covering our mouths for for a long time. Put the, so maybe that's the benefit of that. But common sense controls uh, without destroying the economy. Now we're opening up partially again, and we're not having any major spikes. You got to watch it, right? I understand that. Uh, but uh, yeah, I have been in healthcare my entire life, and I love people. And I I don't I hate to see people die. I've seen enough of that. But you're killing people as well when you shut down an entire economy, and I, I just got to leave it at that. So you, you, you got you hit my pa passion button on that one, Sasha. Um, okay, and then I think if we also demonstrated uh, was that there are differences, obviously, not just internationally but regionally. And then I do see uh, that, you, that you raised uh, again. Uh, but I think this does illustrate that there are differences, uh, obviously, like I say, regionally and, and nationally. Uh, in in the approach and and uh, the sentiment toward it all. But John, you were going to say something. I just want to add to Larry. I think he makes a great point. Um, but I mean, what he said, uh, the the food lines. I think the the epidemic has also showed us that there are really uh, significant vulnerabilities in the economic system that we have built, and. You know, maybe it constitutes an opportunity for us. We are talking about going back to normal. The question is, um, do we really want that normal to be exactly the same as uh, it was before the epidemic? Or can we improve on that? Can we make sure that we don't have that many people who live pay paycheck to paycheck? I think, you know, we may actually achieve both if we think a little bit more creative and if we are not just forcing to just go back to the uh, normal as we used as as we are used to, and then have another shock in uh, in some time. And this can this can come from environment, from other resources, and find ourselves in the exact same situation. So this may constitute an opportunity for us. That's just what I wanted to. Add. And I will use the the host prerogative to opine on anything I feel like opining on. So. Uh, I, when, when I think of Great Depression, obviously it was a huge uh, economic event, but what I really think is, are all of the people that would have certain kind of behavior, which was, you know, eat whenever the food is available, save, do not go into debt, and, you know, and people around them would say he lived through the Depression. You know, it left, it was a, it was a behavior correcting event for a whole generation of people, and it is quite possible. I mean, I know, John, you are talking about the safety net most likely, you know, but living paycheck to paycheck can also be an attitude, right, which we saw in the 20s was very much present, you know, seize the day and such. And then Great Depression hit and everything changed. And we are seeing that now as well. I mean, credit card debt has plummeted something like 20 percent over since the, the, the lockdown. Savings rate is now approaching, his, you know, the levels of 1980s. So, so I, I do also believe that there will be some, some uh, behavior corrections that it will be interesting to, to watch. So I will close with one question that I will again ask everybody, but just in a reverse order. Uh, what are we to do? Larry? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. Um, well, first of all, if we can start at the macro level, because I like what Diana is saying uh, about reviewing from policies down. We, uh, we, we've got to take a look at the large scale problem we've had with inconsistent, incoherent policies across the nation. I mean, I, we, she illustrated it. I mean, we illustrated when we're talking about the. the Larry, you are muted all of a sudden. Okay, let's try that again. Can you hear me? Okay. Now we can. Okay, so I don't know what I left off at. Yeah, that's inconsistent policies. Inconsistent, incoherent policies, and and I think Diana brought it up really well when she was talking about. Uh, 
how it differs from state to state, region to region, and the, the fact that that Massachusetts wasn't required to wear, uh, you know, in that area, well, no face coverings until recently, is kind of kind of blows my mind being from Texas. So, it, so the policy piece at the macro level has to be addressed. Also, at the micro level, I just love what I, I love what the behavior correcting stuff you you guys talked about, um, and, and particularly what Khan uh, uh, talked about was the uh, the opportunity for us to change the way we do business to be smarter, and and such that it's not business as usual; it's improved business and improved savings and improved functionality. I love your analogy, Sasha, about the Depression era of World War II. I thought that was good. And then, I, it, uh, I, you know, I'm not smart enough to talk about the, the mid-level range. I'm going to let you guys talk about that. But uh, in terms of individuals, I can, I can say this, that, that we have to take a look and scan and, and kind of do some reflection on what we are doing right and wrong in this piece. I think it's, a, it's up to every individual to look at their behaviors, their actions, and their uh, essentially what they're doing uh, in their lives to make adjustments that make sense. I'm not going to go visit my grandma um, after. <laughs> I'm just not going to go visit her without uh, without uh, this thing being gone. I mean, we we zoom. Believe it or not, <laughs> my old grandmother zooms. Okay, so there's some behavior changes that are responsible for everybody. Health is everybody's responsibility. It's not just a single person. Public health requires that. So that's enough for me. Okay, Diana. Um, so yeah, this is a, another great question. Um, I think that what I'd like to see us focus on next, and it hasn't come up much on this call, which is interesting, um, is testing. How can we use that? Behavior change is one way to do it, and I think that's important, but it's hard to get people to change. Um, what about testing? And especially at the educational level, we need to get these kids back to school. I'm at home with kids here, a working parent, and uh, you can't open up the economy until you send those kids back. So um, let's see how we can get some industries going and educational systems as well. And if it means testing at the university or at uh, educational uh, levels, then let's do it. Um, we can do some analysis to figure, figure out how much it's going to cost, get the private sector involved. You know, this is the United States. Some say we're the, one of the most innovative places in the world, and we can't figure this out. Um, I, I think we can, and I think that there's innovative ways that we can get back to work, um, making sure that it's safe and using all the resources that we have to do that. And, and I will second that, uh, having also been home with two kids, uh, it will be difficult to get the economy going until they're in school. Uh, Ataman. Yes, yeah, so uh, just uh, building on everything that's been, been said, I think, um, you know, the important things are to save lives, but also um, find ways to keep the economy from sliding further down. Uh, and uh, finally, I think we should do the things that will set the, set the stage to help unleash uh, more innovation and more sort of, um, we have lots of great digital technologies that we don't use uh, especially um, effectively or efficiently. And, uh, you know, think of what different uh, new innovations might come out of that, and we should just set the stage to unleash all of that. Thank you, Ottoman. John? Thank you. I, I think we have a couple of things that we need to do. Uh, first, I agree with you that uh, there is behavior change, but there is also behavior change in the opposite direction. So um, according to one study in London, the renters uh, were paying their rent to the landlords. 90% uh, of them are paying regularly. It's down to 40%. And one of the reasons of that is what also was mentioned before, uh, because they cannot pay. So I think at this point, we have to make the right choice. We have to make two choices. One, I think we have to uh, figure out if we are going to continue with the economic models that we have been using so far, or if we are going to focus on more inclusive prosperity. The inclusive prosperity doesn't mean that we have to for, uh, forego the markets and the business as usual. It is actually more clever 
uh, way to do the business. This is what Larry was saying. Um, and uh, the second one is also what kind of governance are we going to choose? This is important because uh, two separate kind of approach is uh, emerging in, this, uh, 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 in these times. One of them is more totalitarian. The other one is more egalitarian. And this is a decision that we will have to make. We have to reward sound leadership and vice versa. So those are the two really big things that we need to do. And I also agree with, uh, with Larry that everybody has to do whatever they can in their individual capacity. To give you an example, I'm trying to do my part to uh, raise awareness and education on the income inequality problem that's I think in the source of many of the vulnerabilities of the economy here, starting in the principles course. So all of my students had, uh, ha have been exposed to big data and they have been exposed to zip code level income inequality and opportunity inequality in exactly wherever they were living. I think this is where we can start the conversation and hope that it will lead to a change that will make our economy, our lives less vulnerable. Thank you very much, uh, John, and thank you all for tonight, both to the panelists and to about 120 people who have been with us for the last hour and 17 minutes. Uh, there was a lot of good information. I will just close with uh, quoting the Governor Newsom of California. This is not a permanent state. This is a moment in time. Uh, crises come and go. Uh, for many of you on the call, this is probably the first one. For some of the others, it's not, especially people who have lived in other countries. These things come and go. They always seem like they will never end, but they fade into the memory. I think Spanish flu was mentioned only once tonight, and it was much more dramatic. Uh, and nobody remembers it still. So if, I, if there was one thing that I would say is basically figure out what will prepare you better to prevail the next time the crisis hits, not just this time. And that is an individual level. And we also have some ways we can help in the higher education institutions, but make sure to foster those relationships that you have, to bring up the skills that you have and understand this too shall pass. And as we have seen tonight, uh, amid all of the negative impacts, there are some silver linings that I'm sure we will uh, take advantage of. So with that, I thank you all and wish you all a good night. We will make the recording available and we will send you the link to those of you who attended. Thank you. Good night.